This project consistently steps off the beaten path. As a result, we need to do ourselves stuff that on other systems already exists. So this is the startup code. This is what runs before main begins and initializes the environment, i.e. the registers, to a state where we can actually run C and C++ code. We see that we only need to initialize four registers. We're initializing the return address register to zero, indicating this is the start of the stack. We're initializing the stack pointer so that we can use the stack. And then we are initializing two registers called GP and TP. This video is about GP. Here's what you need to know about CPUs that use the pipeline architecture. This is the classic CPU pipeline. It contains five stages. The first stage is called fetch. In this stage, the CPU fetches the data for the instruction from memory. The second stage is called decode. In this stage, the CPU is trying to figure out what is that instruction it just fetched from memory. Stage three is called ALU or arithmetic logic. If we need to perform arithmetic, so addition, subtraction and such, or logic such as AND and OR, this is the stage in which we will do it. Stage four is called MEM. In this stage, we access the memory either for reading or for writing. Last, stage five is called write back. At this stage, we modify any register that needs to be modified. Now, the whole point with pipelines is that as soon as one instruction clears stage one, it immediately begins executing the next instruction. Thus, each instruction takes five cycles, but we're completing one instruction per cycle. But that causes an interesting problem. Suppose you have a program with a global variable. By the end of compilation and linking, you know what its address is. However, in order to access it, you need to encode that address into your code. And on risk, that is not a trivial request. To understand why, let's go back to the pipeline. But this time, let's look what happens if we're trying to execute two instructions, one after the other. On the first cycle, instruction one goes into the fetch stage. On the second cycle, instruction one continues to the decode stage and instruction two needs to be fetched. However, in order to do that, the CPU needs to know two things. It needs to know where it is fetching instruction two from, and it needs to know how big instruction two is. However, at this point in time, we have not yet decoded instruction one. We don't know what it is. We don't know how big it is. The way the RISC architecture solved this, and by RISC I mean all the CPUs that belong to the reduced instruction set category, not just RISC-V, is by having all instructions, with no exceptions, be the same length, opcode plus operand. So on most such platforms, all instructions are 32-bit, four bytes. This means we can start fetching instruction two before decoding instruction one, because no matter what instruction one is, it will be 32-bit. We know where instruction two begins, and we also know how long it is. While this is undoubtedly a very cool solution, it does pose certain problems. In particular, you cannot have a 32-bit operand. So if you want to load a value from memory, you cannot directly encode the 32-bit address of that memory into the instruction. You just don't have enough bits. You need some of those bits to encode what the actual instruction is. As a result, most RISC architectures don't have direct memory access from absolute address. If you want to access memory, you need the address to reside in some register. So now if we want to access our global, we need some register to hold that global's address. Of course, we can just add another instruction to load that address into the register, but that too is not a simple thing to do. We cannot encode a 32-bit immediate value into the machine language for precisely the same reason. We don't have enough bits. So we're using instructions that are similar to those seen here. 
LUI will load the upper part of the register with the immediate value we're providing. So it doesn't load 32-bit, and since the lower bits of the stack pointer are zero, this is good enough for us. But this is not good enough to load an arbitrary 32-bit value. Luckily, we have a macro to do that. So we can say load address of, say, uh, x7, the uh, symbol mem CPY. And now if we compile this, we can see that our load address turned into these two assembly instructions. Of course, the value inside them are zeros because at this point in time, this compilation unit doesn't know what memcpy's address is. If we want to see what this actually turns into, we need to decompile not the specific object, but the entire file after linking. And now we see that it loads two different numbers composing the address 80001cc4, which the disassembler helpfully says, hey, that happens to be the symbol memcpy. However, if we were to turn every single global symbol access into two instructions loading the address and then another instruction getting the actual value, that wouldn't be very efficient. That's before I mentioned that two instructions is for 32-bit architectures. Most CPUs I know don't expand the instruction width for 64 bits. So you have 64-bit registers, but 32-bit opcodes plus operands, which means we need even more instructions to load a complete address into a register, sometimes as many as five. Before I discuss what can we do, let's look at the initialization code again. The RISC V has 31 general purpose registers uh, called X1 through X31. It also has X0, which isn't a general purpose register, it always returns zero. So out of those 31 registers, we're only initializing four. Now you will notice that none of those registers is actually called X something. And that's because certain registers by convention have certain meaning or certain tasks. Those special meanings are defined by a document called Application Binary Interface or ABI. In particular, we can see that we're initializing registers X1, X2, X3, and X4. RA, SP, GP, and TP. And we can see their meanings. RA is the return address, SP is the stack pointer, GP is the global pointer, unallocatable, and TP is the thread pointer, also unallocatable. In this context, unallocatable means the compiler will never issue code that writes to that register, which would suggest we don't even need to initialize it, but of course that would be too neat, right? So here's the idea, and that's listed under a chapter called global pointer, not that one, global pointer relaxation. The idea is to have register X3, aka GP, or global pointer, point to the middle of where our globals reside in memory. Since we otherwise never affect it during program execution, we can just depend on that register containing the right pointer and encode global variable access as relative access to that register, something that looks like this, offset for symbol relative to the GP. The way everyone agrees where that symbol is, is by having a symbol called underscore underscore global underscore pointer dollar. So let's do that. We can take the linker script, search for where our data begins, and actually there is a special section called S data, which stands for small data, which is built to get those global variables that have a chance of being within range of the global pointer. I'll, I'll talk about what that means in a second. So here we can add the definition of underscore underscore global pointer dollar. 
to the beginning of the section. And now we can go somewhere in the code and add a global variable. Going back to our assembly, we can try, for example, to load that variable's address. Now, if we compile, we can see that, as before, our load address turned into these two instructions. But if we now look again at the collinked object, we can see that that turned into a relative move compared to the global pointer. The, the reason we got just the global pointer is because it turned happened to have the same address. If we return to the code and add a second one, Now we will see accesses that are relative to the GP. So that's very useful, except of course, this won't work right now because GP points to zero. That is explicitly what we told it to be. So in order for this to work, we need to load the GP with the address of tap tap global pointer dollar let's compile and if we look at the disassembly of the uh, c runtime the startup code we indeed see loading values into gp and if we look at the final executable we see move gp to gp that's a no-op. Wait, what? Here's the thing. That relaxation, that rewriting of the code that the linker does in order to make pointers that are close to where tap tap global pointer dollar happens to point to more efficient, it did that to our initialization of GP. Of course, this means nothing will work. Luckily, the IBI has a solution for us. If we scroll just a bit further down, we can see that it pushes an option called no relax. This option tells the linker to not change the assembly language. So if we do that, we see that the, G, the global pointer finally gets initialized. There are two more points to consider. The first is that in order for this to be effective, we need all of the globals, or at least all of the small globals, to be bunched together. I'll explain why in just a little bit. So we need to modify the linker script so that small data and small BSS will be bunched together. And also small read only. The other thing we need to make sure is that we have the maximal coverage that Global Pointer can offer. Here's the thing. In order to calculate an address relative to a register, in this particular case, GP, we need that address encoded inside the instruction. And like we said, we do not have 32-bit for that. In particular, for this addressing mode, we have just 12-bit, 4 kilobyte. Those 4 kilobytes are signed, which means optimal performance is when global pointer is dead in the middle of the area we want covered. Now, calculating dead in the middle is kind of difficult, but what we can do is set it to the beginning P 
plus 2k. This way it will cover the first four kilobytes of where our variables are. And indeed we see that GP is now set to a different value and the symbol resolution says it points to global pointer dollar. That's all I had for you today. As usual, you can find all the code in github.com slash CompuSAR and my Patreon page is at patreon.com slash CompuSAR. Feel free to support me if you're so inclined. Thank you for watching.